morning uh, friends in Utsav Church, uh, thanking God for this opportunity uh, and also thanks to Shannon, Samir, Arun and the leadership team at Utsav for this invitation. Uh, I've been really encouraged these past few months uh, to uh, meet Samir uh, in the MTN prayer meetings in the morning and really encouraged to see his heart for prayer uh, and also to serve the larger body of Christ. Now, I've met Shannon a few times uh, earlier uh, and have always been encouraged by his passion for the kingdom, passion for kingdom extension uh, and his heart for God's word. Uh, I feel in my spirit uh, this scripture uh, for this congregation uh, from Matthew 5.14 uh, where it says, You are a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Uh, and my prayer this morning is that truly God will make each of you uh, that city on a hill uh, that is on display for the world around you, not only to see, uh, but also to be attracted and come and enjoy the goodness of God. Uh, the message we'll be looking at this morning is based on the life of Daniel. Uh, indeed, a life lived like a city on a hill. Uh, and he was able to do that with God's help. Uh, but uh, importantly, in the midst of tremendous changes in his circumstances, the title of the message is Thriving in Change. Uh, in the past 18 months, we have all had significant changes in our lives. And more changes keep happening every now and then. After many months of getting used to work from home, uh, suddenly some of our offices started to call us back, hybrid work models. And now some offices have completely uh, worked from the office. Uh, we are yet to settle into any post-COVID rhythms. Just when we think we are settling, something else comes up that's really unsettling. And there's something about change uh, that most of us don't like. Uh, I remember many years ago uh, in one of the offices I worked at, there was a girl who had come from abroad uh, and she developed a real liking for the Indian chapatis. Uh, so she wrote on the back of her chair, uh, chapati monster. Now, when you see the, 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 that written on someone's chair, the, one of the messages you get, of course, is that this person loves chapatis. Uh, but the other message, the most scary message, is that you better don't touch that chair or else you'll get a monstrous response. Personally, I never dared go near that chair. Now, here's the thing. None of us like our chairs to be interfered with, our habits to change and so on. But as it's famously, famously said, the only thing that is permanent is change. And often for our own good, God brings change into our life. He introduces change for our good and for his glory. So it isn't surprising that we see across scripture that the heroes of the faith had tremendous changes coming into their life circumstances. And God uses that to bring good into their lives and to the lives of many people and even nations. So praise be to God as we look this morning at God's word because he gives us the keys to thrive in the midst of change. Daniel is one such shining example. He went through tremendous shame in his life. His circumstances changed overnight when he was dragged into exile from Israel into a new country, into Babylon. He was forced to be enlisted in the rival king's courts. And he was forced to study their scriptures, their ways of living, uh, their ways of dream interpretation, all kinds of things. And his way of living was regularly in threat. We'll just read from Daniel 1, 1 to 7. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylon and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, 
and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. The chief official gave these new names to Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach and to Azariah Abednego. Well, the stories of Daniel, Hananiah and his, uh, uh, Mishael and Azariah are exciting and well known to us. For some of us, uh, we've heard these stories right from our Sunday school days. Uh, who cannot remember the story of Daniel in the lion's den and his three friends who were thrown into a fiery furnace, but they came out uh, without even smelling of smoke. But before we reach these famous stories in the book of Daniel, we see in Daniel chapter 1 uh, that right from an early age, maybe they were even in their teens when they were first enlisted in the royal courts, that they take small steps of faith which have significant implications going for them ahead in life. Daniel and his friends uh, were part of the first group of the Israelites uh, who were taken into exile into Babylon and this was roughly uh, in the year 605 BC. There were two other groups that joined them later. When we read the book of Jeremiah, the Lord says that Nebuchadnezzar is a servant of God being used by God to take his people Israel into captivity. In other words, we surprisingly find that God is the one who is bringing the change in circumstances in Daniel's life. Uh, and not only that, uh, God tells them in advance how to live their lives during their time of exile. Uh, Jeremiah 29 has this beautiful passage in verse 4 to 6 where it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. We see that God is so gracious that he even tells them what to do during this time of exile. He doesn't say, you Israelites, you really had it coming. You asked for this punishment, now you suffer and learn. No, God gives them instructions and prophecies and resources to teach them how to live a victorious life uh, in these times of change. And the first thing we learn from the life of Daniel and his friends is how we can use these keys too to live a victorious life uh, in times of change. The first thing we learn is to be rooted in God's word and prayer. Uh, we see in Daniel chapter 9, 1 uh, that he's studying the scriptures uh, the writings of the prophet Jeremiah and he's clear uh, that these are not mere writings but they are scriptures or the word of the Lord as it says. There were many uh, Israelites at that time who had rejected the prophet Jeremiah but God had given uh, Daniel the grace to believe that this is the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord for the season they were in and he rooted himself in that and because of that he was able to flow with what God was doing through that period of change. Often we too, uh, we can seem lost and uh, uh, wonder which way does God want us to go. And the answer really for us is to go to scripture in prayer and God indeed will show the way. Uh, God speaks to us and the only way we can live a victorious life against the odds is when we are acting based on the conviction we have from God's word. Uh, for the Israelites being away from their holy land uh, and their people was an unthinkable thing. 
uh, but God shows them what their posture should be, how they should be living their lives, how they should be blessing the city they are living in. A story is told that in the old days, uh, before the days of the refrigerator, uh, people would bring these big ice blocks uh, and make it like a little ice house and cover it with a lot of sawdust so that uh, things remain cold over there. Uh, and uh, there were a group of men working in all this sawdust and one of them, uh, his, watches breaks, uh, his watch breaks and falls into the sawdust. Uh, and the whole team is searching for his watch, but it's almost impossible to find uh, in the midst of that sawdust. Uh, during the lunch break, a young boy who has been watching uh, these people work uh, comes, walks into the sawdust, and after some time, he walks out with the watch. Amazed, the men who are working ask him, how did you do it? And he says, I just went in there, I lay down in the sawdust, and I kept very still. Soon, I heard the watch ticking. Isn't it wonderful that when we quieten ourselves before the Lord, it's amazing how He speaks to us. When we are going through a great change in our life, our minds are typically racing with many thoughts. But God calls us to a place of calm and quiet at His feet. Psalm 131 verse 2 says, I have calmed and quieted my soul. Uh, the other day, I was reading the scripture. I, I have calmed and quieted my soul. But my soul was anything but calm and quiet. It, I felt it was so ironic. I'm sitting there and reading, I have calmed and quieted my soul, but I was anything but quiet. And God gave me the grace to pray, Lord, help me to calm down and I just felt God reminding me through the Holy Spirit that it is finished. All the work that needed to be done for your life has been finished on the cross. You don't have to work it out. You don't have to prove yourself. You can just be still at my feet. And that just, just brought such a release in that moment. God speaking to me through his word, bringing me to a place of repentance, to be able to trust Him and to be able to be rooted in His word and to respond in prayer. Coming back to Daniel, uh, there were so many vast changes in their life, but he quieted his soul with God's word and responded in prayer. So we see that Daniel uh, being calm, uh, being rooted in God's word, when he hears of the Babylonian a university program where he has to enroll and learn of the Babylonian culture and scriptures and so on. Uh, he is not shocked. Uh, he is open to go along with what God is doing. Some of us may have seen the curriculum of the Babylonian university and said, no way I am doing this course. I will only study God's holy scriptures. But Daniel is able to go with what God, God's plan is there for them at that time. And he's able to do that because he's rooted in God's word and in prayer. The second important lesson we learn from Daniel is to be not distracted by things that are not critical. In verse 6, it says, Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Well, Daniel, when they were born uh, in Israel, uh, their parents had given them names which had the name of uh, which had the name of God. Like for Daniel, it had the the word El from Elohim, and for Azariah, for example, it had Yah at the end of Yahweh. But when they enrolled in the Babylonian university for their, uh, for their program, uh, they were told, you cannot have names which has the name of the God of the Hebrews. That will change. And now you will have names which have the names of gods of Babylon. And so Daniel's new name became Belteshazzar, which meant Bel will protect you. Azariah uh, became Abednego, which means servant of Nego, one of the Babylonian gods. 
Uh, in fact, most of us, we don't know Daniel's three friends by their Jewish names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We all know them by the names they got in Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Just, just think about it. Some of us, we, we're really touchy. we would be really touchy and we would be really upset if someone were to forcibly change our names, but not Daniel and his friends. In essence, what are they saying? They're saying it's not important what they call us, it's important what they know us for. Let's not trip over this thing they're saying. God has brought us to this place for a purpose and these are the rules of the game. There are many other battles ahead of us. This is not the battle God wants us to fight. We need to learn from their posture. Often we can make non-issues major issues and completely go in the wrong direction. If Daniel and his friends were able to live with names after Babylonian gods, we should think about some of the things that we hold sacred, which may not be rooted in scripture. Are some of the things we take a stand on firmly rooted in scripture? Which brings us to the third important lesson from their lives, to be courageous when God's word is at stake. Just when it seemed like Daniel and his friends are okay with anything in this new city of Babylon, we find that they finally take a stand. In verse 8 onwards it reads in the message paraphrase version, but Daniel determined that he would not defile himself by eating the king's food or drinking his wine. So he asked the head of the palace staff to exempt him from the royal diet. The head of the palace staff, by God's grace, liked Daniel. It's important to note that he was liked even though he took a stand. The head of the staff warned him, I'm afraid of what my master the king will do. He's the one who assigned this diet and if he sees you're not as healthy as the rest, he'll have my head. But Daniel appealed to a steward who had been assigned by the head of the staff. Try us out for 10 days on a simple diet of vegetables and water. Then compare us with the young men who eat from the royal menu. Make your decision on the basis of what you see. And we know from scripture that an amazing miracle happened. Uh, these four men from Judah who trusted God were far stronger with the vegetables and water diet than the ones who had a rich protein diet, including wine and so on. What, a, what an amazing miracle of God. And we note that this stand that Daniel took is at the foundation of his long reign as a senior minister in Babylon. It started with a small step of faith. A well-meaning Christian might have told Daniel, well, you're willing to join the Babylonian royal court. So you're siding with the enemy king. You're willing to be named after the Babylonian gods. Why are you taking a stand on this? What will be the harm if you eat some pork or, or whatever? But there is a difference, Daniel replies. My renaming, he would say, doesn't contradict any scripture. We don't find anything that says, thou shall not be named by someone else. But the Old Testament is very clear about the eating habits of God's chosen people. They were not to eat the meat of certain animals. And even the meat they ate had to be kosher. There was something about the food that was served in the royal courts that Daniel was convinced was against his scriptural conviction. So he took a stand. And this is very important for us to understand. When do we take a stand? We take a stand when our scriptural convictions are at stake. For example, scripture is so explicit about some things. Do not lie. Do not steal. So we want to live our lives with God's help based on these convictions, to uphold these truths. Sometimes we are tempted to hold dearly things that are not rooted in scripture. Someone might say, I will never listen to a secular song. I will, I will never watch a movie. And those things are very dearly held to. But even though they are not firmly, uh, you don't find them explicitly in scripture, it would be really strange if we were to live our lives holding dearly to things which are not explicitly in scripture and wholly losing uh, lo uh, or loosely holding things which are in scripture. For example, keep the Sabbath holy or husbands love your wives like Christ loved the church. 
go and make disciples do not fear do not be anxious now some of these are very explicit scriptural commands and maybe be a people who hold on to these commands and others dearly with our hearts and with all our strength from daniel we learn that we really need to hold on dearly to what is in scripture another beautiful thing we learn about taking a stand is that daniel shows us that we can take a stand while also being very kind it's interesting to see that the people around him really liked him even though he was taking stands that made them uncomfortable his request was declined uh, by the chief of staff but then he went to someone else and again entreated them and pleaded with them and said please can you do this for us and please can you try it out he was very kind and so we see even later in the life of daniel the kings he served they really liked him and one of them even though he sentenced him to death he did not want him to die he really, he was really loved and that is that is because of daniel's kindness he was liked by the people around them and that that really spoke to me you know sometimes i've taken a stand which has ticked off the people around me because i've been very firm and not been so concerned about kindness but daniel shows us that we can take a stand while being kind while respecting people around us and being loved by others finally we learn from daniel and his friends to completely depend on god in verse 17 says to these four young men god gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning and daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds the scripture is very clear where did they get this amazing success god gave it to them it wasn't the excellent teachers in babylon it wasn't their efforts all that god would have used uh, to play a role in their success but ultimately scripture is clear god gave it to them daniel and his friends didn't tell themselves you know we are in this foreign country we need to work double shifts very hard uh, otherwise we will never make it they were completely dependent on god and god saw them through when we stand by our convictions god comes through for us we uh, we've really been uh, encouraged by the life of daniel this morning but when we think about it when we look at the life of daniel uh, we are also reminded of the greater life of jesus he is the true and better daniel daniel was taken out of jerusalem and sent to babylon in exile jesus was sent out of heaven to the earth for us daniel took a stand that glorified god and fulfilled god's purposes jesus took a stand on our behalf glorified god and fulfilled god's purposes daniel was made a minister in the whole royal palace and a representative of his people god's people in the babylonian palace god made jesus a priest forever in his presence who intercedes for us at all times hebrews 7:25 says therefore he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to god through him since he always lives to make intercession for them daniel lived a victorious life with god's help how much more we can live a victorious life because we have jesus interceding for us before god the father he's always interceding for god, for us so let's just praise god and thank god the one who equips us who enables us in the lord jesus christ god bless you uh, with this word thank you mm-hmm.